I'm Dom, Matthew, studio head at Ninja Theory, and I'm here with a incredibly special <laughs> guest today, <laughs> um, who I'll, I will let introduce herself. Hi, my name is Lara Derham. I am principal producer at Ninja Theory, and yeah, I've been here for about 10 years, almost 10 years now. So nearly a master ninja then. Nearly so a master when ninja. Do you, when, do you, when do you become master ninja? Then? Next February. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it's gone very quickly. Yeah, it has, because I remember... So when you joined, so 10 years, uh, 2023, so that would have been DMC no, just after? No, just after. Okay. So there was a project that wasn't announced, was never announced and, and never came to fruition. I was hired as a cinematics producer for that project. Ah, yeah. Okay. That's your background, right? Is in the more cinematic side of production? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Largely. I've done a bunch of different roles as a producer, but I did work for a company in France as a mocap producer. Yeah. And I uh, did some work for a company in Canada in cinematics. So where did it where did it all start for you? And I don't actually know. Like, we've never talked about it. But like, why games and how games for you? It's It's been a, an interesting path, I think. I, I went to university. I studied psychology and English and ended up getting a going into a PhD program in English, uh, which I finished. But... Whilst I was in the kind of tail end of that, the the dregs of that, I was looking for work. I was working in bars and, and a bookshops and that kind of thing. And it was fun and great, but it wasn't a sort of sustainable career path. I was never going to be able to buy a house or go traveling or anything like that on those wages. So I wanted to, I wanted to get a full-time job basically while I finished up my PhD. And I had a friend who was working for a a game studio in Adelaide, Australia, where I was, where I grew up. He suggested I apply for a QA position because they were always looking for people in QA. Uh, I like playing games. You didn't need any training specifically for that. So I thought, why not? Sounds like fun. So I interviewed and I got the position. Uh, and yeah, it's obviously QA, as QA people will know, is not as much fun as people outside the industry think it might be. There's a lot of skill involved in it. Um, but I did enjoy it and I enjoyed the environment a lot. And even after I'd finished my PhD, I kind of felt like I wanted to stay in the games industry rather than banging on the on the extremely tightly locked doors of academia. Mm -hmm. So I shelved all my English plans. I did have at one point in my life, you know, Ivy League University professor uh, kind of as a dream. But um, the reality is that especially in Australia at that time, humanities as a as a discipline was there were no obvious career paths from it the universities weren't really looking for anyone to teach so it really seemed like that was kind of off the cards so I thought well this is amazing new uh discipline that's opened up to me um so why not kind of just jump in so I did uh unfortunately <laughs> shortly after I started working for that company it was shut down but I managed to get a, another job at a, a different company in Sydney that time. So I moved over there and continued working. In QA? Still? In QA still, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's It was an incredibly challenging QA role at that company because they'd been going for a little while already, but their, their tools and infrastructure weren't particularly well developed. Uh, so getting builds to test took hours and hours and hours, sometimes days to to kind of get to a point where you could jump in and start testing and the game was very early at that point but we had some incredibly talented coders who pulled that all around and, and and made it work and then it was really thrilling to see a game kind of grow bit by bit mm. frustrating sometimes boring sometimes but also really thrilling and and interesting i didn't realize you came through that qa route and that's a that's a route that a lot of people come through actually yeah. Yeah. and and i think it's a route that or would you agree that it's a route that that is a really valuable one because it gives you such a good grounding in in understanding games and how games work at, at, at that level. Absolutely. When uh, I'd, I've always played games, I think, my entire life, and I've always enjoyed playing them, but I didn't really give much thought to how they are made, how they're put together. And QA lets you learn from a starting position of basically zero what everybody does what everything means, how how the game gets put together. You learn so much in that role. I'm a producer now, and I think that my QA background has been vital to that. I would recommend that that's the starting point for all producers everywhere. Yeah. Like if you want to get into production in video games, start in QA. It's so valuable. 
what do you think you you did or allowed you to then kind of progress your career in the way that you have to move out of QA and to kind of broaden your your responsibilities to ultimately what you're doing today, which is a very different part of game making? I met uh, some production managers and producers at that role and looked at what they did and it seemed really interesting like QA you get to interact with all different departments and I'm, I think I'm quite an organized quite a kind of efficient person so I thought I could bring that you know that organization that management time management skill to to help in another way so I asked if I could kind of move into a production assistant position and and, and they were okay with that so I did and I worked with the uh, graphic design department, character art, animation um, on that role to to kind of, well, learning on the job, but also helping push a really critical part of the game along. So then you just progressed, like, is it, so QA and then into production. Yeah, and then I continued in production. I should also mention that at that job, I had the amazing opportunity of helping with the the story as well. The, the creative director of that company, um, was looking for kind of a research assistant and because at that when I first joined there wasn't a lot of game to QA so um because of my background he was like do you want to to help me research some some stuff and I said absolutely that sounds fascinating so I jumped into that and for a I don't know six months or so I helped out on that side that was really interesting too but yeah but on to production for me um I the other thing I really wanted to do with my life was travel and I am so fortunate that I had that opportunity because I was born in Britain, I grew up in Australia, but I've got a British passport. And pre-Brexit, obviously, that opened up a lot of the world to me. So I was able to work in France. And then I got a, a visa and worked in Canada for a while as well. Sort of all in production, cinematics production mainly, uh, and increasingly kind of expanded responsibilities. Um, I lived in Montreal for a year, couple of years. It's a lovely city, but ultimately, I cannot hack the weather there. I mm. hate snow. I hate cold weather. And as lovely as Montreal is, I could not manage anymore. So I looked for a job overseas and came up on Ninja Theory, looking for a cinematics producer. Mm. And, and the rest is history. And a lot of people, I think, probably don't understand what production is mm -hmm. or what a producer does. And I think it means different things in different industries and at different studios. Like, what is what is a producer to you? To me. A producer is someone who fills the white spaces between disciplines in order to make sure that a game gets made. It is it's kind of everything. Your job is to support a development team in order to ship a product, uh, whether that is tracking their work, making sure that dependencies are managed, that everybody knows what it is they're supposed to be doing, what the priorities are, kind of pushing and shepherding things along, um, I think as a producer, there is nothing that is not your job. It's all your job until someone else is working on it and then it becomes theirs. And so now in your career, you've kind of come full circle. Yeah. And back to kind of what you studied, really. Yeah. I am now working on the script and the story for Hellblade 2 and I'm directing the performance capture for the cinematics. So it is really strange but also really amazing that that has happened and how that came about was very similar to my very very first job where I offered to help research because that is well within my skill set I'm fascinated by by psychology by history by folklore and that those interests I think put me in a position to really support on the research for this game and then that evolved into helping out with the story and then eventually writing it. Although I do have to stress that the words on the page of a script is the starting point for the game. It is nowhere near the end point for that game. So many people, everybody on the team contributes massively to how that story develops and is uh, portrayed and displayed and, and worked through in the game. So everybody who works on Hellblade 2 is the story writer. Yeah, not just me. What has that experience been like for you kind of stepping out of a more kind of pure production role into something that is a creative role and really putting yourself out there? Yeah. It, as that. It was it's it was terrifying initially. I really 
I thought, well, who am I to be writing these words and, and expecting other people to, to listen to, to them and, and think that this is the thing that we should be doing? You know, you have to get over that if you want to, to get on with things. And I found that just by putting out a first draft, as terrible as it might be, giving it to people, getting their feedback, uh, and then you can just improve it and improve it and improve it and improve it. And it's going to continue to be polished and improved, I think, in, in, in where we can until we ship. But it's just getting over that first initial terror of everyone thinking it's going to be awful. It probably was awful, but people were nice enough to give me constructive feedback and help me to change it in a positive way. So I'm so happy to have this opportunity and it's been so, so much fun, sometimes scary and difficult, but, but a lot of it's been fun as well. And you're directing the performance capture as well, which is a, which is a new thing. That is a new thing. Um, that is also terrifying, actually probably more terrifying than the writing because you were there with all these amazing people who are so good at their job on stage and then you, you're expected to kind of boss them around. Why should you listen to me? Why? Why should you listen to me? <laughs> I might not have written every aspect of this story because, as I said, everyone's contributed to it, but I am the kind of guardian of that story. I need to make sure that that story is told in every aspect of the game and obviously it, a huge component of that is the cinematics. So I kind of pushed down all the doubts and fears and just walked out onto that stage and tried to <laughs> tell people what to do. It was fun. It was fun. It really was. It was terrifying initially, but I think because I'm a reasonably decent communicator and I know exactly how I want that story to be told, it was easy to communicate with the actors. Um, I'm not interested in telling them how to do their jobs. I'm just there to, to kind of make sure that I think that the story is getting told. They're all amazing, especially Melina. They all know their character. They they contribute creatively in, in these roles in so many different ways. It's just my job to let them do that, make sure that they know what the story is before they, they go in and start working. We've wrapped our main shoots, yeah. main cinematic shoots, yeah. so we have pickups to come. If you could kind of go back in time to the beginning of the shoots, and give yourself some advice, knowing what you do now with the shoots wrapped. Like, is there anything that you'd, you'd tell yourself? Yeah, there definitely is. Um, sometimes I went with a script that I wasn't confident in for a certain scene because I hadn't managed to get it any better. And I was too scared to, to, to open up to the actors and say, look, I'm not sure about this line. Can we work on a better way of doing it? Since then, I've tried that and it's amazingly productive. Um, actors love to be involved. I think maybe they hate it that the actors that have been involved in this process have seemingly loved being part of that. So I would definitely say if you feel like something is not landing, just stop filming and work on it and get it to a point where it is. I will stress that the parts I knew weren't landing, we've gone back and subsequently kind of redone. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy with them now, but that was uh, a time expenditure, which we didn't, wouldn't have had to have have gone through if I had just been a little braver in, in saying I need help with this. Yeah. And it's iteration, right? Iteration, I think, is at the heart of how we uh, try and create something that is a, you know, the immersive uh, journey that we want it to be. And I think that's sometimes we get asked, oh, do you have a script for the game? And it's like, yeah, there, there's a script for the game, but actually the script of the game when it's released is very, very different. Like, we, I think we do have a script for Hellblade 1, maybe, but that would have been taken from the game yeah. as opposed to the other way around because of all that iteration and things change on set things change when they go into the game the order of things changes as, as well so so your story is pretty incredible really like like coming from working in QA in Australia moving over to the UK by way of Canada and France, France yeah. a career in production academic background in English, you should have introduced yourself as doctor, by the yeah, way. Yeah, sorry, I should have, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Dr. Laura Durham. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are thinking about, about a career in games and maybe even work in QA and think, great, this is the path that I want. Like, how do you think you've done it? I wouldn't necessarily advise people in QA or production to think that they're kind of owed a creative role. I feel like I kind of lucked into this, that I was in the right place at the right time. Having said that, if people are creative and have stories to tell, they shouldn't be stifled. They should definitely try. But I'm not sure that my path has any lessons, mm. um, unfortunately. I'm sorry. 
I wish it did, but I think I think I it really was. I just I have interests and I have skills. And there was a need for those interests and skills at the at the right time in my career for me to to move sideways a bit and be more creative. But yeah. it's not something I think is easily replicable. I think that's the same for a lot of people's careers, actually, in games anyway. And maybe it will change in the future. But I think certainly here at Ninja, you have people from all different kinds of backgrounds, different academic backgrounds. It sounds to me like the thing that you've done well is nailed every job you've had. <laughs> 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 so that when an opportunity arises you're kind of a person that could be trusted to take opportunities and run with them. Well, thank you. I think there is truth to that in that I, I mean, I, I'm a hard worker. I work hard. I don't like to fail at things. So I put effort in and, and try to make everything successful as it can be. I mean, there are times when I have not managed to do that. I do not want to go into details, but you know, I've, there's been um, downs in my career as well as ups. It's just, I think at Ninja Theory, I found a group of people with the same work ethic and the same ideals as me, and I've just fit in quite well. And yeah, I think we we have been and we will be, we continue to be. Yeah. I suppose perhaps finally, like we say, we've, we've wrapped the shoots now for Saga. So we have a really good idea of what that journey is for Senua and the other characters in the game. What are your hopes for saga from your perspective and what you bring to them my main hope is that people will continue to connect with senua and and find this next part of her journey as compelling as the first one my other hope is that people will relate to the other characters as well and find them interesting and compelling i think there'll always be more uh how do i put this Senna will always be our main character and we'll always be most focused on her journey and making sure that's everything we want it to be. But this part of her journey, it involves her relationships with other people. And so all of those other people who help tell her story need to be in their own way as as rounded and as compelling and have their own journeys as much as Senua does. So I hope people can connect with them as well. So it's bringing through those actors' performances into the game in the truest way that we can and that they, like you say, Senua, I think, landed in a place in people's hearts. Yeah. And you know, I share that feeling that in Saga, we want to make sure that happens again. Yeah. But that uh, all of these other characters that, that are part of Senua's journey can kind of land in people's hearts as well. Yeah, that's my hope. Cool. Um, so which of the Robocop films <laughs> is your favourite? Uh the first RoboCop is the only RoboCop movie as far as I'm concerned. You don't like RoboCop 2? No. Really? It's okay. But I don't. You, what, what don't you like about RoboCop 2? It's just the first movie is a perfect story in itself and there's no need to add to it. Uh, yeah, okay. And the remake, no, thank you. I've not seen the remake. It's, it's competently made. But as we were discussing earlier in the kitchen, the core of the first RoboCop to me is that the pathos of of his ignorance of who he really is and that coming out of him, that humanity, to me that is the movie. Yeah. In the second movie they make it so that he's just always known what he is. It's not as good. I think of Robocop 1 as being, I don't know, there's a bunch of movies around that time, like Terminator as well, that were kind of not horror movies, but they were, like Robocop is almost a horror movie. Yeah. Because yeah. It's, it's almost like a... You know, it's gory and it's violent, but it's like a psychological horror yeah, because it's, it's that horrific thought of being Murphy. Absolutely. It's a psychological horror movie, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I, I haven't seen the, the remake. Because like, the original Robocop was an 18. Mm -hmm. And I think the remake was a 12. I don't know. I think it is. Which kind of, I don't know. I like those 18 rated action movies that you don't get anymore, like Terminator and Predator and Robocop commando i won't keep listening around back okay. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't tend to make those anymore well, th those movies are all all great and and fun to watch but to me robocop is is elevated above that because of the core existential crisis ontological crisis at the mm. the core of it which the others don't kind of really have is that one of your favorite movies then? It almost sounds like it's one of your favorite movies. I don't know that it is one of my favorite movies. I don't go back to it often, but it is a beautiful movie. Yeah. So what are you watching at the moment? Um, now Succession is finished. I am bereft. I am heartbroken. Uh, so I need to find a new thing to watch. I, Succession to me was utterly, utterly, utterly delightful and amazing. And I absolutely loved it. I'm devastated that 
I'll not get to spend some time with Tom Wom- Womgans anymore. Is it done, done? Like it's done, it? done, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, all gone. And how many seasons is it? Uh, that was four, I think. Okay. Really good. I need to watch it. I haven't yeah. seen any of it, so it sounds like something it's I need beautiful. to watch. It's beautiful. It's a black comedy, basically. Yeah. Um, with some truly terrible people hurting each other, and it's a great show. Um, I've also I've just binge watched. I think you should leave uh, with Tim Robinson as well, yeah. which is exquisite, and very funny. I binge watched the third season as well. Like literally, as soon as I realised it was there, I just turned it on and sat there and watched the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, very very good. And you play a lot of games. What are you what are you playing at the moment? Um, so I came to it a bit late, but I've just finished Cult of the Lamb, which I absolutely loved. Very 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 cool. I'll have to find a new one. I I play a lot of games of different genres. Um, obviously, I first came to games through narrative games like Tomb Raider and Silent Hill. Silent Hill is my favorite series of all time mm. and really opened my eyes to the possibilities of, of, of storytelling in games. Um, but I play I play a lot of stuff. I like simulators. I got the the new content for Power Wash Simulator the other day. Yes, because I've seen you playing yeah. Power Wash Simulator at your yeah. desk. Yeah. Very um, intently as well. Yeah. Like you look like, <laughs> I think you're kind of giving off this air of like, I'm playing Power Wash Simulator. Like, do yeah, not, do not disturb. Do not disturb. <laughs> the story of that game is interesting. I'm, I might be inaccurate here, but I'm pretty sure the creators just noticed that people like that kind of thing and decided to lean into it completely. Yeah. I mean, it is really, really therapeutic and soothing and um i could i could do it for hours i think it it helps me think it really does like i while i'm playing i don't have to engage my kind of conscious creative brain in it that's my procedural brain and my conscious creative brain can be working on other problems and thinking about other things which um which is really really fun yeah i think it's those kind of games are kind of it's almost uh mindfulness it's like a mindfulness Mm. experience it's just uh a switch off it's one of the things like playing zelda at the moment like a lot of people are and uh, very early on but i kind of i just i like it when i don't have to do anything and i'm just running around like in a field and it's kind of nice and calm as soon as it's like here's a taxing thing i'm like oh like can you can, i don't want to go in a shrine and solve a puzzle yeah can i not just hang around outside in the sunshine yeah I love narrative games, but I also like games where you've got the opportunity to create your own narrative within a world mm. I used to play a lot of Warcraft and one of the great things about that is that you have so much choice in, you know, what you choose to do. You can go and do the main quests or you can decide that you're a fisherman and you're just going to go fishing and that's what you do. Yeah. I've never played Warcraft. Hmm. It sits outside of everything else. Like it's such a massive thing. It's like, to me, it's like going in a Warhammer shop. It's mm-hmm. like if you go in a Warhammer shop, like see you in six months and yeah. you're going to have like, <laughs> that's, that's your life and that's what. Yeah, but it's so cool to be into Warhammer now. All the celebs are doing it. Oh, really? Yeah. Is it a big thing now? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, I think I saw something about, didn't someone say it was nerdy or something? And oh, I think Henry Cavill's into it. Yes, yeah. that's it. I think he got criticized for it or someone said it was a bit geeky or a bit nerdy and he was like, hold up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Um, I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did and we'll be back soon with more from the team here at Ninja Theory. <laughs>